I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. Today we go up to the University of Rochester in New York to speak with Dr. Stephen Sulkis, who is the incoming president of the AADMD. Steve, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you. So uh, I was uh, looking over your resume here, and you know, uh, one of my heroes, Steve Perlman, who was one of the co-founders of the AADMD, uh, spoke so highly of you, and uh, I said, you got to meet this guy. And oh, um, you have dedicated your life, really, to those of us with developmental problems, with neurological problems. Uh, tell us how you got into that, and what is it you do? Okay. That's a great story. I, I actually, unlike many people who work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, had no personal experience with, 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 with this population. In fact, when I was applying for pediatric residencies, where there were programs that had obligatory rotations with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, I actually sort of like graded them lower because I was scared. And I happened to end up at a really great residency program at the time in Syracuse, New York, at Upstate Medical Center. And while I was there, they created a rotation for pediatric residents focusing on developmental and behavioral problems. And I was one of the first people to go through it. And it was pretty creative. And one of the things that they did was, like in the first or second day, they had us go to a state institution in Syracuse. And after some introductory talk, they had us go and meet some of the people who lived there. And the first thing I was asked to do was feed a guy lunch. And this was a guy with cerebral palsy and behavior challenges, and he was nonverbal. And I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And I was wearing more of the pureed food by the end of that meal than he was, than, than ever got into him. And I was thinking, oh, man, this is going to be a long month. Anyway, I got my lunch break and I went, they, they then had me go to this guy's program area where he was getting served, you know, in day program. And there I see this same guy who I couldn't do anything with responding to, the, to a very creative teacher in that room and doing various tasks. And every time he successfully completed a task, they wheeled his wheelchair over to a wind chime that was hanging in the middle of the room where, where, where he could get at it and he would whack the wind chime and get a big smile on his face. And I thought, oh man, did I misjudge this guy? I, you know, this, and did I misjudge the entire field? Well, over the course of that month, I spent time in schools, in community settings, and really got to see kids with developmental disabilities in settings that were not health settings. And I suddenly realized that these people, that these kids had lives and they were cute and they were fun and they were playful. And I went to one school that I will never forget. It's a wonderful place called Juonio in Syracuse, where it was a preschool where half the kids had disabilities and half were typical kids. And at recess, they went out in pairs to the playground and I went out after them. And when I got out on the playground, if the kids weren't using adaptive equipment, I couldn't tell which kids were which on the playground. I thought, this is it. This is, you know, this, this is Valhalla. This is the way it's supposed to go in the world. And I said, this is, boy, have I been stupid. You know, I, and I had sort of an epiphany. And I realized not only had I misjudged my, you know, what I thought about this population, but I actually was kind of attracted to working with this population. So I applied for fellowships. And my wife, who's also a physician, was going to be doing fellowship somewhere. And I figured I was going to do primary care. And I ended up applying because she was applying in Boston. I applied at Boston Children's and got a fellowship with Alan Crocker, who you may be familiar with. Alan was a giant in the world of developmental disabilities uh, and an absolutely wonderful person who was tapped into the essential humanness, humanness of every, every individual he met. And he just, just taught us about that. And I came out of that two years saying, okay, this, I can do this all the time. I'm not just going to do primary care and meet and, and serve people with developmental disabilities on Friday afternoons. This, this is going to be what I do all the time. Came to Rochester, New York, and my friend, now mentor, Phil Davidson, 
who was the head of the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities here at Rochester. I met with him and he actually helped me find a job working at a state institution where I was for a year. And then after that, I was able to move over to the University of Rochester full time. I've been here ever since. I started training res pediatric residents and then other residents. And then we started a pediatric fellows program that we've been running now since about 1985. And then later on, I got lucky and we got funding from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau for what's called a LEND program, Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities. And we've had a LEND program here training both not just physicians, but people in 12 other professional disciplines for the past, oh, 20 some years. And I've been able to, to have fun seeing patients with developmental behavioral challenges and working with an interdisciplinary team and learning from all the people around me the whole time. That was a long answer, sorry. It was a great answer and I love hearing your passion and your love for this. Tell us about the rest of the developmentally disabled uh, supportive community up there in Rochester. You got a big band up there, don't you? We do, we do. We're, we're, we're very fortunate. Uh, we have, a, we're one of the biggest divisions of Golisano Children's Hospital here in Rochester. And we have, as I mentioned, the, the, our LEND program, which is you know, a, a funded fellowship training program that works in a bunch of different disciplines. And we also have the Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities, which is uh, the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. The USED network and the LEND network are two nationally funded, federally funded uh, groups of places. Uh, USED's exists in every state and territory. I think probably people who hear your broadcasts are familiar with USEDs. They do service, they do training, they do research, and we get to do advocacy. And that's just one of the few federal grants that, that says you're supposed to actually do advocacy. It's very, it's very exciting to actually have in your job description that you're supposed to go talk to politicians. Uh, very cool. It, yeah, I mean, the, the university is, gets really nervous about that, but we say, hey, we got to. It's in, our, it's, it's in our grant. We have a really big program here doing clinical service and my and several of my colleagues who are much better researchers than I am have a really uh, exciting research program focusing on autism spectrum disorders. So we have a bunch of, in, in addition to all the supports we provide to schools and families uh, and the clinical work that I do and the other MDs here do, we're, we're pretty busy. Now, we don't just serve people with autism spectrum disorders. We serve the entire range of developmental disability. So we're working with people with spina bifida and Down syndrome and cerebral palsy and everything else. Give us some of the idea of some of the specific types and names of entities that you're involved with and give us a feel for that. I had the good fortune when I was a fellow 30 plus years ago to help run the Down syndrome clinic at, at Boston Children's. And so I got to be a little bit of an expert, not a super expert, but you know, I, I, I developed a level of comfort working with people with Down syndrome to the point where I'm asked to see, and my colleagues here are asked to see most kids with Down syndrome, even though uh, a lot of their primary physicians feel very comfortable working with people with Down syndrome. They, they're not turning their primary care over to us, but we're providing consultation. So, and, and, we, and so we will help them remember to think about some of the health problems that are more common in people with Down syndrome. Sometimes we'll find ourselves thinking about behavior stuff that turns up in a person with Down syndrome or some other condition. And, think, and I mean, in fact, I got a great example. There was a guy who was older. He was in his 60s, who I was asked to see a, a couple of weeks ago. And he was in the hospital and they were discussing whether or not he was safe to have a gas, whether he should have a gastrostomy tube to help him help him be fed safely because he had swallowing problems. So this is an older guy in his 60s who has Down syndrome. And there was, the question was, was he able, did he have capacity to weigh in on whether he wanted to have this gastrostomy tube or not? And I went over and spent a few, time, a few minutes with him and I couldn't 
actually find him. He was not verbal with me. And I asked the people who were with him, is he talking? And they said, no, nah, he's kind of mumbles a little bit, but he doesn't really seem to be talking. I said, so I, but he seemed to make really great eye contact with me and seemed real responsive. I, I said, so has anybody tested his hearing? And they said, oh, his, he hears. Huh. I said, well, if, do me a favor. Can we just make sure, send him to audiology as long as he's sitting in the hospital anyway? They sent him to audiology. He has moderate hearing loss bilaterally. And they put, we put amplification in. Now he's, now he starts responding to me much more. And when I asked him, did he want the gastrostomy tube? He said, no. And I said, really? Cause it could make you sick. You might aspirate and get pneumonia. I said, yeah. and he said, and you, I have to actually go where you can put my hands where you can see it. I said, you know, how about this tube? And he, he's doing this to me with his hands. And I said, does that mean no? He said, yeah, no. And I was like, okay, you were, you're, you don't want the tube. I get the message. You know, uh, and it was, but I, you don't, you didn't need to be a rocket scientist to say, check the guy's hearing. But I knew that people with Down syndrome are much more frequently having hearing problems that can be progressive when they get older. So I got, you know, I was able to provide that kind of consultation. You know, so. you bring up an interesting point with this on Down syndrome. I'd just like to pursue this a little bit. Sure. Um, one of the problems we have uh, is say one is a pediatrician, okay? They treat children. And yet, you go to pediatrician's office, you see 29-year-olds in there who've been treated the whole way. With your expertise, you were just describing a 60-year-old adult. Um, do you find it a problem in overcoming the artificial specializations, per se, according to chronological age, or is that not a problem? Uh, well, it, it's, a, it's a problem because I'm really, I'm, yeah, I'm board certified in pediatrics and developmental disabilities and whatnot. And so, you know, people know around the hospital that they can call and get me to provide consultation, but I'm, but I'm limited. I'm not going to take the, take a 29 or 63 year old patient on as my patient long term. But no, I, I, so, so developmental disabilities specialty can cross, you know, and we have colleagues who are providing service to people with developmental disabilities across the lifespan here, uh, and that's a that's a big push to help make that transition to adult primary care for people with special health care needs. That's that that transition is is a big barrier. Helping primary physicians be smart and comfortable, and making themselves accessible for adults who have developmental disabilities and, and, and similar kinds of challenges is a huge problem. That's a big part of what I'm doing is trying to help, help identify some of the people who are most receptive in our region and give them the tools they need to effectively and comfortably serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and continue to make a living doing it. So it's, it's, uh, I, I, there, it's interesting. I, I don't know if you've met uh, my friend Matt Holder yes. from AADMD. Matt is the director of a clinic that focuses on providing primary care to people with developmental disabilities. And he and I have a wonderful ongoing debate about this because he, his, his clinic is great. It's receptive. It's got all the accessibility options. People think about behavioral challenges and are able to deal with them. But he can't serve all the people of Kentucky who have developmental disabilities in his site. There's just too many. So, so my concern is that we, we don't want to replicate Matt Holder's kind of program everywhere. That may not be economically feasible. And plus, people should be able to get primary care where they live, you know, in their communities. So, so he and I have a debate going that's a friendly, respectful one about, about which should we be doing, developing specialty clinics or, or find, figuring out what we need to support community primary care providers 
to, to so they can be more receptive and maybe only serve a few people. If, I mentioned our LEND program and that we have people in all these different disciplines. And we have, oh, 15 to 20 people come through each year and they're all graduate students or, res or fellows and you know, advanced folks who want to focus on developmental disabilities. One of the most powerful experiences we give them is to connect them to a family and have them go into the community and visit the family in their home or go to, the, go to a person's school or workplace and, and have the kind of experiences I had when I was a resident of actually seeing what people's lives are like, where they are living and, what the, and, and seeing the challenges, but also seeing the successes. When you get out of your professional bubble and start seeing people as people as opposed to patients or people we're serving, I think that's profound. And I, I my, my little dream, so it's, it's been working great for our LEND trainees for many years. Uh, my dream is to have every primary care physician and dental resident coming through the University of Rochester healthcare system have that kind of experience. Just two, three visits with, with, with an individual or, the, or a family where you're not being asked any medical or dental questions, you're there to learn, and you're there to learn about the person's life, and find out about the family and what and and the, and the circle of support that that person has. I think once we get out of our professional bubbles, we I, I, we can understand people as people and not just as patients. And I think I think that suddenly turns us into much better healthcare providers. Now, with you taking over as the head of the AADMD now, what- Well, not for a year or two, but yeah, go ahead. Not yep. for a year or two, but when you do is, are you, um, or right now, uh, is there any push to do anything differently within that great association? Yeah, uh, we are trying to, well, we just went through a very, uh, very good strategic planning process for the organization that that we're still sort of figuring out the path that that we're going to take as we as we grow and and thrive we are welcoming not just physicians and dentists but people from other clinical disciplines uh, optometry um, nursing dental hygienists yeah, general, right. Yep. And so because serving the population that we serve is inevitably an interdisciplinary activity, we want to maintain our focus on health uh, because there are other organizations that are interdisciplinary that address the needs of the population that we're talking about. But what AADMD has as its main byword is, is health and and. Broad, health broadly defined, uh, but that, I think that's going to continue to be one of our big pushes. We continue to partner with Special Olympics and AUCD and other other organizations uh, to to do things that make health more likely to happen in all kinds of different settings. Uh, actually, w one of the other things we've been talking about, and this is actually one of Rick Rader's big efforts that I admire enormously. His brain is different. Is, yeah, is is his focus on helping to train direct service professionals uh, who work with people with developmental disabilities and are the the aides and you know direct support people who are in many ways at the bottom of the professional chain. Sometimes they, they are coming into the field not, not knowing much about developmental disabilities and learning it as they go. And, so, and what they may be learning may not have much to do with health. It may have a lot to do with behavior and habilitation. So, so helping that group to be smarter, continuing our work with people who are coming up through our professional training programs, whether they're professional schools like dental schools or medical schools and residencies and engaging engaging people. And then finally, as I said before, continuing the policy push 
to make sure that that the healthcare system that we're working in doesn't ignore this population uh, and doesn't and, and and attends to the health disparities. Now let's say I'm a healthcare provider. I might be a dental hygienist. I might be an orthopedic surgeon. I might be a dentist. I might do root canals, and I have listen to you today and I want to learn how to take care of this special population so I feel comfortable it won't kill my bottom line at the office and I can really get into it and get comfortable how do they get a hold of you? Well the best way to get hold of me in a situation like that is to contact AADMD AADMD.org uh, or AUCD.org I'm you know we have a list of members and a list of uh, and, a, and a directory, uh, and both of those organizations are 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 made up of people with a variety of interests. So I'm I, I'm here at University of Rochester, and you know you call University of Rochester Medical Center, you'll call Santa Children's Hospital, you'll find me, and I'm you know, people can call me and email me or whatever, but. I think, I, but I may not be the perfect guy to answer the question you've got. Uh, we do actually have, you know, for providers in our community, we have a uh, a provider hotline for people to call up and ask questions about their patients, uh, because we realize that sometimes all you need to do is give give somebody a couple pointers and they can handle it themselves, uh, rather than just taking over the patient and being a being an an in-person consultant, we can be a remote consultant and get the job done. So all of these are ways to do it. Uh, but but I encourage the people tuning in to recognize the value of these other two organizations. And as well as, you know, when it comes to kids, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a, has a council on children with, with special health care needs and council on children with disabilities. And the members of, of that council, the council and section, are pediatricians who particularly care about this population. So, we're 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 all over the country. So, those are three great organizations, and you, you can find me in all of those. But, and, but you'll find people with even you know, with, with skills that'll light up even better for what you're looking for. Well, we've had the great pleasure today of talking to one of the people who's making a big difference in this world, Dr. Steve Sulkis up there in Rochester, New York, from the AADMD and so many other organizations. Thank you so much for being with us here on Exploring Different Brains, Steve. Thanks, Hacky. Joy to be with you. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.com.